Hello, everyone, and welcome to Petite to Queen's Claim Your Career Crown podcast. I'm your host, Lynn, and today I'm joined by our wonderful guest, Patty Block. And we have such a great conversation in store for you. We're going to be talking about pricing your services and the surprising new way and be paid your worth. Doesn't that sound fantastic? I'm going to tell you a little bit about Patty. She teaches women business owners who are expert in their fields how to turn up their power to price, sell, and run their businesses on their own terms. This means fine tuning their operations and scaling their revenue for strategic growth. As their trusted advisor, Patty brings a unique perspective having experienced and solved many of the same complex issues women face, such as as leaders, as moms, as daughters, and as sisters. Forming a partnership of unbiased accountability, she helps women position their companies financially, operationally, technologically for game-changing results. Patty raised three fantastic children, all of whom are business owners, and also work in her own company. She's essentially raised her own workforce. So Patty, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. Well, we are thrilled to have you and this is such a great conversation. And for any of you who are joining us for that very first time, you know, make sure you don't miss out on a single episode by subscribing to Claim Your Career Crown wherever you get your podcasts. And while we're on the subject, if you love what we're doing and love these episodes, please take that extra moment to give us a five-star review. We would very much appreciate it. So Patty, let's just sort of get into, I'd love to get some background. Um, What inspired you to get started? So the Block Group is the second company that I've owned. The first focused on political consulting and lobbying. And I loved it, it was fascinating, and I'd never do it again. But it was a great training ground for what I do today. And I grew up with a very entrepreneurial father. And he was an orthopedic surgeon. He always had his own practice. So I think that was kind of baked in as I was growing up. My mom ran his office for almost 50 years. And so I watched that small business really grow and thrive. So having my own business as a political consultant was wonderful but frustrating because i i was really a good consultant but i didn't know how to price i didn't know how to sell i really was winging it and i had the company for about eight years and then i had a surprise divorce and i had three little kids at home and part of my strategy was figuring out so my revenue was tied to the election cycle and which was up and down all the time so in order to even out my revenue i added the lobbying which is great but the trade-off was travel so i realized immediately when the divorce started taking place that i needed to stop traveling be home and stabilize things for my kids but one of the other big frustrations for me was If there were resources to help me manage my business, figure out the strategies, learn how to price appropriately, I didn't know how to find them and I didn't know who to trust. And especially in the political arena, you don't trust anybody. So it was very frustrating. And that motivated me to want to be that resource for other women business owners. And in particular, because as women business owners, I think we face very unique challenges and we're juggling a million things. So that set me on that trajectory. But I had a little bit of a um, detour. You know, as we're growing up, we think our life is gonna be a straight line. And of course it never is. And so my detour was that I needed to get a job so I would have health insurance for my kids. And so I took a job at an international school as director of development handling marketing, public relations, and fundraising, and then became director of operations. And then all the pieces started to fall into place because I was planning this company, which I started in 2006, and took both those motivators, my frustration with not finding the resources I needed as a business owner, 
and not knowing who to trust and wanting to bring my experience in operations to the small business market. So that's the genesis of this company. And it has really grown nicely. I work with women across the country. And the whole concept is helping them generate more revenue with less stress. And in particular, the old corporate model never worked for women. Yeah. It sure doesn't work now. And so as we try and emulate what we see out in the market, it is, becomes more and more frustrating. So the, the whole concept here is helping women figure out what they want their company to look like, how they're going to build value, and then I help them implement that. So I serve as an outsourced chief operating officer, and I help my clients grow their companies in a way that works for them. Right, right. And I know that I'm really particularly fascinated um, with the process that you go through to, when you're putting this together uh, for them, and also um, the process around the pricing. And because I, I see that that's one thing, you know, that women will underprice or undervalue uh, their work. So I'm really curious to hear more on, you know, that that, that process uh, of both helping them set up their operations and then and, and that connecting point of understanding um, the how to price their product and their services. Sure. Well, we always have to start with awareness. And when I was growing up, my mom used to make these fabulous cookies. The whole house smelled good. It was warm. The cookies were gooey. I mean, it was really good cookies. And my whole life, I watched my mom eat the broken cookies. But it wasn't until I was a teenager that I even thought to ask her, why do you only eat the broken cookies? Do they taste better? And she laughed and said, no, I eat the broken cookies so you can have the whole ones. And not too long ago, I saw this really shocking statistic. 62% of women rely on their business for their primary income. And 88% of those businesses make less than $100,000 a year. Right. And all of a sudden, this image of my mom eating the broken cookies pops in my head. And put all, putting all those pieces together, I realized that's what we as women are doing in our companies. We're bringing that spirit of self-sacrifice and we're putting ourselves last. Yeah. So everyone else, our clients, our staff, our families, everybody else gets the whole cookie and we live on crumbs. And I call that the broken cookie effect. So when you start to understand that dynamic, you can, it, it, it's the beginning of that mindset shift of understanding the value that you're really bringing to your clients. And especially because I work with women who are experts, they have spent their lives getting educated, getting advanced degrees, working in usually in corporate or having their own company and building their reputation and their experience. So you're bringing all of that to your clients and yet we're not charging as though we are. So that was a huge disconnect that I saw a pattern that I saw in every company I was working with. So let's go back to your process question. And I also want to go back to something you mentioned a moment ago, which is, charging what you're worth. And I'm going to pivot that and talk about it a little bit differently because I seriously believe, firmly believe that every human has innate worth okay. and your pricing and what you do for your business is not a reflection on your value or your worth. So even though we hear that commonly in the market of charge what you're worth, I'm not sure that's meaningful. Yeah. So the focus really needs to be on defining your ideal buyer, who is a, an ideal buyer. And I make a distinction between an ideal buyer and an ideal client. And the reason I do that is because all we hear is about find your ideal clients. But an ideal client does not happen by accident. It happens when you find an ideal buyer, you guide them to be ready to buy, they become a client and you onboard them. And to some extent, you're training them 
to be an ideal client. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a great twist. That's a great twist, actually, on on um, on that concept. Absolutely. Right. So set aside, and what I often tell my clients is separate the sales and the service, because as long as you're worried about who's going to work on what project and how you're going to scope it and how you're going to price it, you're not focused on guiding your buyer. And it's a big distraction. And what often happens is we get into that process psychologically thinking, oh, yes, this is how I'm going to price it. And this is how I'm going to take care of this client. And then they don't become a client. So you've gotten the cart before the horse and you haven't completed that process. So part of what I teach is how to price based on value. And when I say that, it's about perceived value, which right. means, and here's the good news, with perceived value, you have the ability and the power to build that. You can actually build value in the mind of your buyer. So then it becomes a matter of once you've defined your ideal buyer, is how do you find them? How do you engage with them? How do you connect? How do you have those conversations? For a lot of technical experts, and I know because I am one, the biggest stumbling block is communication. We feel as though if we talk about ourselves, we're bragging. We often, and I'm based in Texas, and we have a saying here that it's not bragging if it's true. So we have to get past that feeling of bragging about ourselves because you're really not. If, if you're talking about your accomplishments and you're talking about the expertise that you bring, that is hugely valuable to your prospect. So again, it's shifting how you're thinking about it. Once you've identified, found, and engaged with your ideal buyer, then I teach a process where sales becomes more like matchmaking. And it's not nearly as painful as making it up every time you have a prospect or using a scripting method that doesn't work for you and often doesn't work for women. Yeah. So again, that's the part of that process of what I call painless selling. And as you do that, you're leading your buyer on a journey to be ready to buy. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it sounds a lot like what some of the, my work, not um, that I do as well, because it's the client journey and understanding uh, to build that relationship, the rapport, um, to guide them to a decision. And uh, that's really just fascinating. And I, I was really wanted to pick up on one thing. It sort of sounded like maybe at one point it held you back about, um, you know, you know, often for women, especially um, it's that we will often talk in the we, you know, we accomplished this or we did that instead of saying, you know, hey, you know, <laughs> look at me, you know, I did all this. Um, uh, and I'm just curious, is that something that you encountered that it held you back of being able to, um, the air quote here, brag about your accomplishments? Definitely. You know, I think especially in Western culture, we're raised as girls to typically be quiet typically let others lead the way. And it is very ingrained in us to be polite, to be friendly, to be, to be whatever you're raised to be. And um, so we have to kind of work against that as adults to think differently and to behave differently. And to keep in mind that a lot of what we are experiencing are habits. So yes, right. uh, and I will tell you, that one of the ways that I was able to break some of those habits is through politics. Because I can work a room like very few people you've seen, right? I learned how to do that and how to be an extrovert in certain circumstances because I am a dyed-in-the-wool introvert. <laughs> so for me, that being quiet is my natural state. And I would much rather observe and, and tune into, use my intuition and my perception, right? So it's a, it was really a challenge for me, but it also brought me out of my shell. 
by working in the political arena where everyone else is so loud <laughs> and no one hesitates to brag, right? So it's just such a different culture from how I grew up and what my natural inclination is. But it also, because I was training candidates, I was also learning how I can communicate differently and how I can speak up and speak out. And so that was a great training ground for that. And it's a big part of what I teach because again, most of my clients are very happy to observe and to tune in to the people around them and not necessarily to speak up or speak out. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that just definitely sounds like something that a lot will hold a lot of people back in specific your clients is sort of getting you know pushing forward and out of that comfort zone i mean there's other things that i i pick up that women do a lot i knew that i do a lot where you apologize for things that there's no reason for you to apologize in the first place <laughs> you yes know? or you'll say um i i've used this i'm trying to stop but you know you know i know i can be I can be bossy and it's like why you know you never hear that come out of a man's mouth why you know and why am i saying that um it's like i'm um excusing myself for being assertive and being an expert and being able to talk with confidence and assurance on a topic <laughs> it's like why why and it's that ingrained habit so i'm just sort of curious what do you observe you know, as the introvert observer, um, what holds people back in general, women back, and uh, specifically uh, the clients that you work with? Sure. So some of the things that hold us back as women is that uh, apologizing all the time. <laughs> and sometimes we're saying sorry as a habit. So when we have a group conversation, for example, and we want to say something, we'll say, sorry, or I don't want to take up too much space or something like that. And I have to tell you, my, it's, my skin crawls when I hear that because you're not taking space. You're not taking anything, you've earned it. And so that's part of what really holds us back is feeling as though we don't have the right or we haven't deserved, we haven't earned that ability to speak up. So that's part of it. The other word that I hear all the time that I wish we could all eliminate is just. <laughs> when you say just anywhere in your sentence, you are diminishing and devaluing what you just said and what you're going to say. So, and that is a terrible habit to break because again, it's so common, but much yeah. more common for women than for men. So what I often suggest is try and insert the word please instead of the word just. So just want to add something. You could say, I want to add something. You can leave out the word just, or you can say, please take a minute and think about this question instead of just take a minute. So yeah. trying to alter your language or drop that word will help you be more assertive and as you practice of course it's going to feel awkward at, at first but as you practice it will become much more natural and people will respond to you so much better so those are some of the things that i do recommend and are hard to do yeah no absolutely i mean i recognize it myself and i'm i'm still working on it right <laughs> i'm aware of it um i mean we felt so passionate about it we actually have like some articles about you know stop apologizing uh and uh the words that really need to be eradicated from our language just the same thing that women will tend to use can and could instead of will and would um and just being very i you know i will look for some of those things like the word just and um you know, the, we use that a lot. For some reason, it's just like this filler word um, and more adjectives, things like that. And I go through and look at things before I, you know, we use the content or before I send an email and I'll rethink what I'm saying. And at least I'm okay. putting that conscious, but it's it's still like sometimes it will come out of my mouth and I and it's like, why? <laughs> exactly. And I do the same thing. I'll draft an email and then I'll go back. And I'll look at it very carefully and I'll think about 
How is this going to be received? I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that we as human beings make when we are communicating. And yeah. that is, we think if we said it, the other person got it. Yeah. And that, that is almost never the case. And we make these assumptions. So our communication is so much less effective. And we always need to keep in perspective how the other person is going to hear it, receive it, interpret it, and respond to it. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes because something makes sense um, in, for us, when we're writing the communication, it, that isn't conveyed in the communication. So it, it's like, I don't even know what you're, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand what you want me to do. And um, that, and, and it's not clear. So definitely taking that moment to go back and look at the communication and verify that, you know, how does someone else, if I didn't know about this topic, does this make sense? Does it flow? Do I have all the information that's needed? And taking that moment saves you a whole bunch of time uh, on the other side and a lot of confusion and um, it just makes everything flow so much better, right? It does. And, you know, that reminds me of another thing that we do often, and that's use the word let's. Let's get it, get together. Let's do this. Let's do that. And we're not instructive. So who is included in let's? Who's us? And I see that very frequently. And so then there's a back and forth, especially on email or Slack or whatever system you're using. There's a back and forth because you're not clear. So it's so simple to review that after you've typed it and go back and say, I recommend we do this and this and include this group of people and be more instructive. I think we worry that people are going to see us as bossy. And I mean, exactly the word you used a few minutes ago. And we need to let go of that because people will see us as assertive, as positive, as instructive, as a good leader. And we right. overlook that and we automatically go to, they're going to think I'm bossy. Yeah. <laughs> and I've gotten way past that. I don't worry about that at all. And I want to be clear because I pride myself on having leadership qualities. And that's true of all my clients and my colleagues. We consider ourselves leaders. And that means you need to communicate in that way. Yeah, so true. So true. Um, I love this um, discussion, Patty, but as we wrap up, I would love you to share with our audience what they could do next or should do next. Let's not use the could. What should they do next um, so that they can move forward and um, be able to uh, really step into their own power? So one of the exercises that I recommend that I think is very powerful sit down with, and of course it can be virtual, but sit down with a colleague who knows you well, you know them well, and you know the other's business. You know what they do and how they interact with their clients. And you write down every aspect of what you believe is the value they bring to their clients. And they do the same thing for you. And then you exchange and you talk about it. And it's very powerful because you need outside perspectives in order to understand the real value that you bring. And I'll give you a quick example. When I went through this exercise and I actually did it and then checked it with several other people and kind of, I wanted to test it, some of those words. And one word that kept coming up was calm. Now I would never, put that as something of value that I bring to my clients, the fact that I'm very calm and I have a calming voice. And yet I kept hearing that from others. So, and it's interesting. And then when I tested it, everyone said, oh yeah, that's the word I'd use for you. And that is a value because my clients, when they're freaked out about something or something terrible may have happened or something that has really caught them off guard, they trust that they can contact me and I'm going to help calm them down. And that is very valuable to them. So again, that's based on that exercise and the feedback that I've gotten. And I promise when you do this exercise, you're going to have things that surprise you. Right. And that's a good thing.
It is. I think it's a great, I actually recommend people do th something very similar. And um, sometimes you can do it one-on-one -on -one or you can do it in a small group as well. And it's very powerful to, to get that input and feedback from others. And um, because, you know, really looking at some of the positive glowing things that people are saying about you. And it's just like, okay, well, this is really true. This is who I am. And this is what I bring um, and how I help the world. And so I need to incorporate that content and that, that um, into how I'm presenting myself. So Patty, thank you so much for sharing pricing your services in a surprising new way and being paid your worth. Um, I want to have you share with our listeners because I know that they're going to want to know where they can find out more about you and connect with you. You bet. So you can reach me through my website, theblockgroup.net, theblockgroup.net. And um, I have so many free resources. Please avail yourself of them. That's why I have them on the website to help women business owners. I think we all need to be doing a better job of helping each other. And so connect with me through my website. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn and it's Patty with a Y. So Patty Block. And when you do, please make a note that you heard me on this podcast so I can make that mental connection. And I love connecting with people. So please feel free. All right. That will be fantastic. And all of those backlinks are right down below. So Patty is one click away. Um, this has been such a fabulous conversation and it was quite calming, Patty. Um, and for those of you who tuned in, if you have any ideas that you'd like to share, um, we love hearing from you. You can leave a comment down below. And if you have a question or would like to suggest a specific topic for discussion, you can email us at join the conversation at petite to and of course, to stay current on all of our insightful advice, our breakthrough advantages, and incredible episodes like the one today with Patty, you can sign up for our weekly wisdoms newsletter at petitetoqueen.com. I want to thank everyone who's tuned in and who's listened. And Patty, thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful discussion today. Thank you. I really appreciate being here.